And here we go. Well, this morning, we're coming back to John, as, as you would expect. And uh, we are now, um, on our calendar, we're a month away from Easter, believe it or not. Easter's early this year. It's at the end of March. We're a month away from Easter. And based on our reading in John, uh, at the, after this morning's passage in John 17, starts the entire proceeding of the rest of Jesus and the crucifixion. So, uh, so if we keep our reading schedule right, we'll be right on Easter when Easter happens this year, just a month away now. So, so just to let you know where we're going. So here we are. We're in the, uh, we're in the Garden of Gethsemane up here. And uh, again, this is the view you get from today's Garden of Gethsemane down at the bottom of the Kidron Valley. You're actually looking up at the uh, outside wall that goes around the old city of Jerusalem, the, uh, the Golden Gate right there, which uh, would be um, roughly in the same spot that that gate was that, uh, that entered into the old Temple Mount area on the eastern wall. Anyway, we're down here. It's, uh, it's night, um, and so these are, these are the discussions that Jesus has with his apostles. Uh, today will be the close of these private discussions, these private discussions with the apostles. Uh, and it's very late night in the Garden of Gethsemane. And uh, we looked at John 15 already and John 16, which were all talked about while they were down the garden. And now John 17 is, uh, is where we're at. And this is the, um, the, the high priestly prayer, is what they call it, uh, that Jesus prays on behalf of his apostles and prays it very out loud for their benefit. And we'll see that just in a second. So as we start into John 17, I want you to put yourself in the shoes of the apostles and realize that Jesus is actually going to pray aloud for your benefit so you can eavesdrop on what he's saying between him and the Father, and you can understand something brand new about who he is and what your role is as following him. So keep, keep alert to what he says, because he's saying this out loud deliberately so you can eavesdrop, and that's why he's doing this. So let's just jump right in, right into John 17, uh, and, and John gives us a clue of the context. He says, Jesus spoke these things, And lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Now remember, when we said the word glorify, we're talking about this idea of revealing something in in a new and big and bold way so that it causes awe from those who see it. So what he's saying is the hour has come. I I want the reveal, the the reveal that will result in awe about your Son uh, to happen so that the Son may reveal and result in awe about you. So uh, what he's getting at is that this, this hour that has come, we're going to see something brand new, uh, perhaps for the first time, about the nature of the Son and about the nature of the Father himself because of what's going to happen in this next hour. And of course, we know it's the crucifixion, and that's going to tell us something brand new about the nature of God in the Son and in the Father. So he says, I glorify your son. That's what he's asking, that the son may glorify you. And I skipped to verse four. I glorified you on the earth. That is, I made known, I, 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 my job was to reveal you and to create awe about who you are. I did that. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. So Jesus is saying that uh, he's, he's, uh, he's finished is what it is. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Now this, this last phrase here, this verse 5, is a little disturbing to people because what Jesus is saying is that he's saying, he's, he's equating himself with the Father. He's saying, glorify me together with you. So as you're glorified, as you're made known, as you, who you are, the nature of who you are is revealed in all results, I want to be right alongside with you. Glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which we had uh, which I had with you before the world was. So he's really, this is one of the strongest Trinity statements that you'll find in all of the book of John uh, because Jesus is saying, I mean, he's claiming equality with God, not only in the sense that God's glory, I mean, revealing who he is, is also something that's part of the revealing of who Jesus is. Uh, glorify me together with yourself. But not only that, he's saying glorify me with the the awesome reveal of who we were, who we are, before the world actually was. So, um, so he, he's, <laughs> there's just no way to, to misread this. Jesus is saying basically he's equal with the Father, and that any glory that there was about the Father is also included in who Jesus was. Uh, identical in that sense. And that's the same glory, the same understanding of who the true nature of God was that existed even before the world existed. So, uh, so he's saying, now let's basically, if you summarize this whole glory statement, it's, it's Father, let's uh, completely uncork in a way. Let's completely open it up. Let's totally reveal who your nature is 
and my nature in you so that between the two of us together, we can all be known in terms of our nature to all of mankind and leave nothing, nothing uh, uncovered in that sense. So this is what it's all about. It's about making known who God is even in the face of Christ himself. Now I skipped over verse 3 right here uh, because I wanted you to see all the glorified statements he put right here because this is the purpose of his prayer and what's going to happen for the rest of the uh, timeline in the history here. But what's in verse What's in verse uh, 3, 2 and 3? This is what he says right here in this little block here. He says an amazing statement. He says in 2 and 3, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that is the Father giving the Son authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. And, And what is eternal life? This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. So here, in the middle of all these glory statements before and after, he's telling us that the whole issue about eternal life is knowing the Father and knowing the Son together in that sense. That's, that's eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. Again, Jesus puts himself on the same level as the true God himself, saying eternal life is knowing God, which includes knowing Jesus and God and Jesus and, and God and Jesus, one in the same. So that's eternal life. Eternal life, so in that sense, isn't really about heaven and the circumstantial greatness about what heaven is, you know, the golden streets and having all my needs met and no more sorrow, which, you know, which may all be parts of what heaven's about. But eternal life, that is real God-defined life, is life that comes from knowing God himself. And so, uh, so he's saying uh, the Father gave him authority over all flesh, over all men, um, and that, uh, and that he made known to them that this big life, this abundant life, like he said back in John 15, that they might have life abundantly is really all about knowing God. Well, that makes sense in the context of this passage, because what he's saying is that, uh, I want to glorify you. I have been glorifying you. That is re- making known, revealing the true nature of who God is. So it causes awe both in verse one and verse four. And how do we do that? We do that in such a way that because people will come to know who you are, they will find big, abundant, eternal life in knowing this God. So that's really, if you get down to it, that's the whole point of, the, of why Jesus came, was to reveal who this God is so that we might discover that real life, real living, comes from relationship with him. And so that's what Jesus has been all about in, during his entire ministry, glorifying, making known, causing us to respond in awe, drawing us to himself. And now, in the, at this juncture in Jesus' life, he's saying, the hour has come, let's finish the glorifying. Now, what is it that needs to be finished in the glorifying? And we'll see that in just a second. Okay, so he pushes on, and he says, kind of as a prelude to the rest of his prayer, uh, he doesn't ask for anything just yet, but he's going to say a few things before he prays on their behalf and our behalf. So here's the mission accomplished statement. He does in verse 6. I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words which you gave me, I've given to them. And they received them and truly understand that I came forth from you, and they believe that you sent me. So Jesus is giving us a kind of a summary mission accomplished statement right here. And what is it his mission was to accomplish? Remember, we just talked about glorifying God, making known, revealing who this true God is, causing awe in us and drawing us to him as we come to know him. Well, that's exactly what he's saying here again. I've manifested your name to the men whom you gave me. Uh, Manifested your name. If you remember in the ancient world, uh, your name is actually a, a, it's a compact summary of who you are. Uh, it's a, if you think of it as like a reputation, is closer to what we think of today. So what he's saying is that I've made known, I've manifested, I've made very clear to people what your reputation is, who, who you are, um, what you have done, what we can expect you to do. I've made your name known to the men whom you gave me out of this world. Um, and then he goes on and says, interestingly, they were yours. This is like a shepherd speaking right now. They were yours, these sheep that were here, and you gave them to me like an under-shepherd in that sense. And they've kept your word. So again, the kept isn't performed obedience. It's treasure and guarding and holding it near to their hearts. And so so these ones have been given to Jesus uh, and he's taken care of them. And he's manifested the reputation and name of who God is to these men. As a result, verse 7, 
they've come to know that everything that Jesus had came from the Father. That, that Jesus is a perfect representation of who the Father is in every, in every respect, his nature, his, his passions, his love, everything exactly the same. Um, and so the words that Jesus had from the Father, he's given to them, and they receive them, and now they get it. They truly understand where Jesus came from, which is from the heart of the Father himself. Again, it's kind of an underscoring of the, the writer of Hebrews who says that Jesus is the radiance of the Father. He's the out glowing in that sense of who the Father is. Because of the light of the Son, you get to understand who the light is himself, the Father. So, uh, so they believe. So mission accomplished. The guys that you gave me, they get it. They believe that you sent me. So they understand that Jesus isn't just a man who's a preacher and an itinerant kind of charismatic leader. He actually has been sent from the very heart of God himself. So before he asks, he continues this prelude, and he says, um, Verse 9, I ask on their behalf. I, I don't ask on behalf of the world, that means the entire world, but of those whom you've given me, for they are yours. Again, I think of this as an under-shepherd speaking for the sheep of the shepherd. I ask for these who are yours. And all things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I've been glorified in them. Here, you know, we talked about last week, he was talking about the things that are God's and the things that are his. Everything that's God's is his and vice versa. Here, those things that are of God are actually these apostles and the people who will follow later on. They're, they're in a real sense a possession of God. They're a flock of God in that sense. They belong to him. And we talked about uh, weeks ago about how the, uh, uh, in a sense, the inheritance, God's inheritance, not the inheritance he gives us, but the, what comes to him is, is us ourselves. We are, we are his treasure and his precious ones. So he's saying that these precious ones that are yours are mine and they're also yours and I have glor and I have been glorified in them that is because of who they are because of the fact that they're owned by you as a precious and beloved flock and also by me as a precious and beloved flock they they have because of their existence glorified who God is I have been glorified in them see that so Jesus if you want to understand a little bit more about who the true nature of Jesus is uh, look at the apostles. He's been glorified in them. Something radically has changed them, and that transformation testifies to the nature of who Jesus is. So he says, before I start my, my asking, I ask for these guys. Now, it's interesting. He doesn't ask on behalf of the world. That is, he's not, he's not asking for like a general blessing on the world, which uh, is the misinterpretation many times of the Christmas passage where the angels show up and say, you know, say, uh, goodwill toward men. It's not just a generic goodwill toward men prayer. He's saying for those you've given me, those who are your flock, I'm praying for them specifically right now. And in a second you'll see he's going to broaden this prayer, but not to the whole world. But he is going to broaden this player, prayer to include you and I. Okay, so now he's going to move on and start asking. So here we go. Uh, I'll make a list that we'll come back to later so we can review this. He's going to start asking now with those preludes done. He says, I'm no longer in the world, verse 11. And yet they themselves are in the world, and I come to you. Uh, so we know this is what's happening. He's going back to heaven to be with the Father. So he says specifically, Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you've given me, that they may be one even as we are. So again, the keep word is not a perfect obedience thing. Holy Father, keep them in your name. Well, remember his name is his reputation, his reputation and his power and what he's known for. And so he's saying, since I am no longer in the world, I'm coming back to the Father. Since I can't be physically here to protect and guard and keep them, well, Holy Father, you do that job now directly. You do that job in your name. That is in the power and the reputation of who you are. Protect them and hold on to them as this flock who are in the midst of wolves in that sense. Keep thinking shepherding. You protect them. You keep them. You guard them. Uh, and he says, do it in your name. That's the whole reputation of the Father in heaven. The entire, you do that with everything, every power that you've got. The name, which, by the way, you have given me. This causes some consternation here, too, because, um, I mean, what comes to mind immediately is in the Mormon thinking, if you look back in the Old Testament and you see the name Jehovah, they think that's the name for Jesus in the Old Testament. And when you see Elohim, that's specifically the name of the Father in the Old Testament. You know, a separate kind of thing. That has a lot of problems all by itself when you start tracking down how those words are used. But here, Jesus specifically says that the name that he has has come from the Father. 
Now, what, what he's saying is very clear in ancient Israel. They would look at this and say, you mean you're telling us that you have the name and reputation of the Father himself? And he would say, according to this, absolutely. So again, it's a Trinity moment. Everything that the Father is known for, both in resources and power and passions, everything he's known for, that's, Jesus has that same reputation, that same name. It's astonishing. So again, he's identifying very closely with the Father, but saying, since I'm physically leaving, Holy Father, you keep on this protection um, process that I did while I was here. And then that last phrase is curious. You would think that he would say, Holy Father, keep them, protect them in your name, the name which you've given me, so that the evil one won't take them down. That's what you would think. It'd be a continuation of the keeping and guarding idea. But instead he says, keep them and guard them so that they may be one even as we are one. That, that's, an odd, that's an odd twist in the logic of this entire thing. And yet, if you think about the fact, go back to a sheepfold idea, if you go back to the idea that uh, in a sheepfold, uh, the sheep are tightly kept together, and in keeping them together, they're protected from the wolves that come from the outside. You know what the, t- the chief tactic of a wolf is to take down a sheep? is to separate the flock, and in separating and bring division in the flock, isolate the weakest ones and take that one down. So it's very much a classical strategy of Satan to divide. And in dividing, you know, separating that, that tight knit neck character of those, in that dividing, being able then to pick them off one at a time. And so he's really thinking that right here, that they may be one, even as we are one. And not separated that way. That's how you. That's part of the process of keeping them and guarding them, as a as a shepherd would. And then he brings up a Trinity moment in those last two words again, that they might be one, even as we are, one, as we are one. Um, there's only one God, and Jesus and the Father together with the Holy Spirit are that one God, and that's exactly what he's saying right here. He's also saying explicitly that he wants he wants the apostles and by extension us to share in that same kind of unity now through the giving of the Holy Spirit. We can be part of that that large one unity. He'll talk about that more in a second here. So here's his first thing. Father, I'm going away, so you keep them. And then he goes on and and continues this keeping idea in verse 12. So while I was with them, that is physically with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you've given me. There is that thing again, the, the Father's name, which you have given me, one in the same reputation, same resources, same power. And he says, and I guarded them. It's again a shepherding idea. I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. And there he brings in the idea of Judas, which was not a surprise to anybody, um, because it was a fulfilling of scripture itself. So I kept them while, while I was here, in your name, with your resources, with your power, with your passion for them. So then he goes on and, and prays that our joy would be made full. First he asked that the Father would intercede and take care of the apostles and us directly, since Jesus is physically leaving. Now he says, let's talk about joy for a second. So 13, he says, but now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I'm going to stop right there for a second. He, what he's saying is, uh, in, in these things I speak in the world, I'm physically standing right here, both feet on the world, for the purpose, for the purpose that his joy would be made full in them. So uh, in large measure, this, this entire John 17 prayer is about letting us eavesdrop um, almost behind the scenes with the Father and the Son so that in what we understand and learn from it, our joy will be made full. And it's the joy that comes from Jesus. His his joy might be made full in us. He says, 14, I've given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they're not of the world, uh, even as I'm not of the world. So I've given them your word. And, And I want you to keep track here of how prominent the word is from this point on in his prayers. He's saying basically something about the fact that he has he has handed on to the apostles God's word, that because of that, because they have kept that word, that is, they've treasured it themselves and they have a passion for that world, it has actually caused them not to be part of this world anymore. It's, it's actually started this process of pulling them out of the world. And because they've been pulled out of the wor- world because of God's word, the world has started to hate them. And uh, so, so he says, that's what I did while I was here. 
I gave them your word, and the world has hated them as a result. And my word has caused them to become not part of this world anymore. But the promise is, interestingly enough, in this little paragraph, is that their joy would be made full. And it's kind of funny to try and rectify, how is their joy made full if the world, now because of what Jesus has done, has started hating them? (laughs) So clearly, the my joy made full is not about us becoming more like the world and more likable to the world and fitting in with the world. Our joy somehow is linked to the fact that we're no longer part of this world. And if you think about the fact that at the end of Revelation, uh, when, when all time wraps up, it's a, it's a time and a place where there is no more sorrow, there is no more tears. It, it's, it's very much not a place like the world we are presently in. So at the end of the book, at the end of the story, we're clearly not part of the world anymore. And you know what? That's not such a bad thing because this place has been deeply affected by the, the fallen uh, decay and toxicity of sin. And so, uh, so we're being pulled out of that, even right now. Even right now, we're being pulled out of that and becoming less and less a part of this world because of the action of God's word in our life. So hold on to that because he'll mention that again. But this is the source of our joy being made full, not, not becoming integrated with this world, but becoming disintegrated with this world. So he'll, he'll go on more about that. The joy made full. He says, now I don't ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. And that's an an interesting twist because many of us would think from the previous verse, okay, you want my joy to be made full? Well, take me out of this place. (laughs) Take me out of the the place of sorrows and tears and injustice. I mean, it's, it's the fallen nature of this place that makes for me not having my joy full. And he says, but, you know, that's not what I'm going to pray for. I'm not asking that you take them out of the world. I'm, I'm asking that you just keep them from the evil one. Interestingly, then, there is a great value to both the apostles and to the rest of the world that they'll go talk to by leaving them in this toxically fallen place. But there is a danger, and the danger is the evil one. And here he, he personifies evil. Evil is not just a general malaise of mankind. Evil actually emanates from a person, the person of Satan himself, who actively stalks us, who actively looks for opportunities to divide us and then take us down. Someone who strategically and tactlessly, no, with tactics, comes towards us uh, to to steal, kill, and destroy, he said back in in John 15. So um, so here we, uh, that's not John 15, John 10. So here we are, Uh, with the evil one who wants to take us down. So Jesus is saying, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but that you just keep them, keep them from the evil one. Because these ones now, this flock, this flock of apostles, they're not from this place anymore, even as Jesus is not from this place. In fact, in Jesus' discussion with the Pharisees back in John 8, he says, uh, I'm not of this world. Um, He talks to... uh, to um, Pilate at the end when he's just before he goes through all those trials and said, and Pilate asks him, are you king? He says, well, yeah, but not of this world. So really um, the kingdom, the kingdom of, hi- of, of Jesus is something that goes far beyond just this time and place. They're not of the world, so protect them from the evil one who is the prince of the power of the air. Now, how is it, I mean, just practically speaking, how is it that the father keeps us from the evil one? I mean, does he just um, shoot, you know, powerful thunderbolts and lightning and, and scare away demons and stuff like that. I, you know, that could be part of it in the background. But it, Jesus is going to tell us right now how, that's, how this works. And before we look at it, think about this for a second. The evil one, Satan, uh, primarily comes at us with the tool of deception. You've got to keep that in mind. Uh, he's, he's much more, he's much more um, effective in our life to the degree to which he keeps himself hidden. <laughs> uh, and it, the degree to which he keeps himself hidden. So what he does basically is he whispers lies. He introduces lies in and around us. And if we, if we in, a, in a weak moment, tend to swallow that lie, he gains our voluntary cooperation in our own destruction. That's what a lie will do. So how do you combat that? Well, this is how you combat that. Keeping them from the evil one, verse 17 sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And and so there it is right there. If Satan primarily steals, kills, and destroys by using untruth, 
by deceiving, then sanctify, which is the process of removing us gradually and more and more out of this world. You do that by promoting the truth. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So the whole idea about keeping us from the evil one is about keeping our head straight in the truth, understanding the truth that comes from God. Your word is true. So as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. I don't want you to take them out of the world, but I'm sending them even deeper into the world at this point. So for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. Now you see that verse 19. For their sakes, I sanctify myself. Let's see if I can get my point over the word. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, right there. I sanctify. Does that mean Jesus is becoming perfect or sinless? No. Again, if you remember the idea that sanctify is all about the the gradual process of removing us from the realm of this place, this fallen place. And that's exactly what Jesus is going to do in a very short amount of time. He's going to die, be resurrected, and he's going to pull himself out of this place, physically speaking. And so he's saying, since I'm sending them into the world, that last line, um, they need to be also sanctified. That is, continue the process of being removed from the realm of this fallen place through the use of of God's word, which is truth. And it's truth that does that. And if you think back, if you think on your own life right now, the things that make you a foreigner in this place is largely the truth that you embrace. Um, and, the, and the truth that comes from God about who Jesus is, about the fact that he's the King of kings and Lord of lords, that he is indeed the fullness of God himself in flesh, all those things, that is what will start to pull you away from the people who um, are settled in this place. And they don't like that. So that's, that's what pulls us out of here, is our understanding of the truth. And that's how he's going to keep us from the evil one. And then he goes out back to this unity idea in verse 20. And uh, again, he says, I don't ask on behalf of these alone, talking about the apostles, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may be one. So here's where we're included. Yay, finally. (laughs) We're actually, by extension, included in this because because we have come to know Jesus through the work of the Holy Spirit and through his working in concert with the word that went to the apostles, that eventually went into the paper pages we have in the Bible that we read. We've fallen in love with him through that. Uh, Very much, we, we uh, we are descendants of the apostles and in a great respect that way. Those who believe in me through their word, through their word. And that word which they got from Jesus and Jesus got from the Father and that word is truth. So again, Jesus is saying, I'm not just asking for these guys, but I'm asking for those who are going to come after them. Uh, that, and again, that they may be one. And not necessarily that they be kept from the evil one, but that they may be one. Unity is turning out to be a gigantic issue in Jesus' prayer, that they may all be one. Why is unity such a huge issue? And I, and I know that many times we talk about unity and say, well, you know, who is pro-unity? I'm pro-unity. You know, who's against unity? Well, no one's against unity. That's a good thing. But why is it so key right here in his, this final large prayer? He will explain it. Even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. So the unity he's talking about, this oneness, isn't just you know, oneness amongst ourselves. It's not just a one, oneness amongst the, the physical apostles themselves. It's a oneness actually with God himself. In the same way Jesus says that there's a oneness between the Father and the Son, um, so that the Father is in the Son and the Son is in the Father. You know, This is language he's used before but that we're also in him and he's also in us. So uh, unity means there's one thing. And the only way you can say that with propositions, uh, propositions is to say we're all in each other. (laughs) And so that's what he's saying right here, that they may all be one. That is our life with Jesus physically gone will be characterized by the fact that we are deeply and intimately um, in fellowship with the Father and with one another as a result. And, And that'll be evident That'll be evident um, in the places we walk. So here's his prayer, not just for the apostles, but for us, that there would be a oneness with the Father, with God himself, and with one another, so that they may be in us. Remember just a little while back, Jesus was saying that he's asking that, um, uh, that when the Holy Spirit comes to us, that the Father and the Son then will both come and abide in us. I mean, how is that, how is that really possible? 
Well, he's saying it again right here. And, and the, the actual rubber meets the road explanation is that that's through the Holy Spirit. That's how the Father and the Son, through the Spirit, abide with us and near us. That's why the Holy Spirit is one who is called to be near. Um, that's the parakletos. So, so unity here is actually unity with the Father. So that, now whenever you see these two words, that means he's going to give you the reason. So let me stop right here and ask you, what is the reason that unity with the Father and with each other is so important in Jesus' prayer? What is the so that? And I, I could come up, I was thinking through a huge list, like, well, so that, you know, so that people won't see us fighting and arguing all the time, and if they don't see us fighting and arguing, then uh, they'll know there's a supernatural kind of unifying effect in our lives that's unseen or something like that, which could be part of it. I'm not sure that's really it. Or so that you could say, so that uh, they don't consume all their time in bitterness and anger and division and backbiting and, and all that stuff that's so counterproductive and there won't be time for the word. Eh, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, unity is good for so many reasons. But Jesus' reason here is actually pretty predictable. And here's what he says. I want them to be one, to have this unifying unity with the Father, Son, and with the rest of the believers so that the world may believe that you sent me. So, here you go. Unity is important because that unity with God and with one another as a result is a testimony to the fact that Jesus himself came from God, emanated from God, the radiance of God himself. There's a, there's a gigantic testimony to the fallen world in our unity with the Father and with each other that says Jesus is who he said he was. And, and that's... Uh, again, the benefit isn't necessarily to us. He's not saying, I want them to be one so that their life will be comfortable. <laughs> He's saying, I want them to be one with us so that the world may know who I am. And I, this is actually a, a very practical, I mean, this just makes a whole lot of sense. Because when people come to the Lord, they come uh, many times on the large basis of the fact that people who have already come to the Lord uh, are are displaying transformed lives. Something something's different, and something has caused a radical change in the course, uh, uh, the trajectory of someone's life. And people stop and say, well, hey, what, what's that all about? I mean, how can that be? And how is it? How is it that somehow now you're exhibiting, uh, say, a loving kindness that's different, uh, a, a patience or a passion? Say, I don't get what what has radically intercepted the line of your life and changed you. Well, that, that's, that's the unity with the Father as we, as we have fellowship with him that changes us, that radically changes us. And so that testifies to the fact when we say, what, what was the change agent that caused this huge radical change in our life? Did we take a Dale Carnegie course? No. Did we diet differently? No. What caused this change? Jesus caused this change. And that's what we say. Jesus caused this change in my life. That's the only way I can explain it. And then suddenly, the nature of who Jesus is is made more manifest. He must be from God. There's no other explanation for this. So that they may believe that you sent me. We're a walking testimony of where Jesus came from and who he is because of our unity with the Father and with one another that's apparent to the world around us. So he goes on. That we may all be one again. It's all about the identity of Jesus. It's not about our comfort. 22, so the glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity. So again, we're back to this. In me, in you, in everybody, that's the unity idea. It's the blurring of that distinctiveness. There's a unity. But he, he says an interesting thing in 22. The glory which you've given me, so the glory which the Father has given the Son, I have given to them that they may be one. Well, what is this glory? What is this reveal that causes awe that's part of who the Father is that has been given to the Son and now has been given to the apostles? What is, what is that nature that's made known that causes a reveal that results in awe? Well, it's that unity, it, the, that they may be one just as we are one. So there is this, there is this um, awesome part of the reveal that Jesus is not just an independent agent of the Father. He is actually the Father incarnate. There's this oneness, this inseparable oneness um, that's there. And, and what he's saying is that, that that's a glory. That's, a, that's an awesome reveal. That's a mind blower. You have, um, you have a 
person who is fully man in Jesus and someone who is fully God. And in that unity, uh, indistinguishable unity, um, that's exactly what I'm giving to them. This ability to have that kind of unity as well with the Father, with us, um, that's what I've given to them. That ability for that unity, to be that close, to be that intimate with God himself. And then he just says it explicitly with all these prepositions. I in them, so Jesus in the apostles, you in me, the Father in the Son, that they may be perfected in unity. So we look at this, we look at this word right here, this perfected in unity. Does that mean that they are sinless all of a sudden in this unity? That they don't sin anymore? That they're actually perfect human beings? And uh, no. Uh, <laughs> when you see the word perfect, almost always when you see the word perfect in the New Testament, it's the idea of completed. Uh, it's the idea of the end of a process. Um, we, the, the analogy I use many times is when someone's working on a recipe and uh, you know they have a starting recipe and they make it and they taste it. Go, oh, you know, this could be a little better if I change this. So the next time you make it, you make a note and you change something, you add something different and you taste it and go, oh, you know, this could be a little better if I do this. And over the course of many years, my mom's recipes have become perfected. Now, it doesn't mean they're perfect. It means that they're at the end of a, of a long-going process. They're at the end of a process that makes them um, uh, complete in a sense or finished in a sense. And that's what he's really getting at. This whole idea of perfection is about coming to the completion of a process, a finishing of a, of a road. So I and them, you and me, that they may find completion in unity. That, that, that might be, that's the end of that road. The end of that road is, um, is that we might find unity in God himself, that we might become um, included in the intimate closeness and nearness of being in relationship with God. That's that unity he's talking about. And that's the end of the road. That's the completion that we're aiming toward. Um, not, not just to be sinless, but to actually be included into the deepest fellowship with the Father himself. That kind of unity. I and them, you and me, that they may be perfected in unity. That they may all be one. So that, okay, here we go, we get to guess again. <laughs> so that what? What do you think it is this time? I mean, choose something in your own mind why is it that we want the end of the road, the completion, the finality of their process to be unity with the Father? So that what will happen? So that uh, I can make a few guesses. So that uh, life won't be unhappy anymore? Or so that, um, I mean, what? So that they might enjoy life? So that the joy might be made full? Maybe that's what this is about. Well, actually, here it is again. So that the world may know that you sent me. It's the same thing. And love them even as you have loved me. So he's added this second phrase to it. And it's the same as before. The unity will be a testimony to the fact of where Jesus came from, that Jesus actually does have divine credentials, came from the Father. But part of that credential now is the proving uh, that the apostles themselves are loved and loved them even as you have loved me. So, um, so what is visible to the world in this unity with God is the fact that we walk with an understanding and with a confidence that God loves us, even in the same way that the Father has loved the Son when he came physically. And again, that's a, that's a radical thing for people to observe in our lives. It's a radical thing, especially in the midst of conflict that comes up or despair that ought to you know, push us off the edge, uh, things that, are, that can be crashing blows to our experience in life. And yet if there's something of a... Of a a rudder in people's lives that that's based on a, a stability that's based on the fact that God loves them and and that they can't be separated from His love despite what circumstances look like despite how things go down and and seldom because of them well then maybe there's something I'm not seeing about the fact that they're settled in someone else's love the love of God Himself um, and and that will point back again to who Jesus is because we'll say. I have experienced the love of God through what Jesus has done on my behalf, loving me by dying for me. And as you say that to people, people will hear, they, they seem to be convinced of the fact that they're loved by God himself because of what Jesus did, did for us. That's a remarkable thing. How can I enter into that kind of loving intimacy with my creator as well? So that's exactly what he's talking about right here. The unity 
Unity with the Father is actually unity with the Father that allows us to enjoy his love and display that love as we walk in it in life. That's what he's talking about right here. Finally, he's going to come down with some of his final requests right here. And here's, here's a wonderful one that should really encourage their hearts. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am. Father, I desire that they also. Well, who are the they also's? I mean, didn't he already pray uh, and tell the apostles just earlier in the upper room that, um, you know, in my house are many, many uh, places to live. And if it wasn't like that, I would have told you there's plenty of space for you. Don't worry about that. But no, I desire that they also. And many people think that he's expanding the list here to the people who will come to a, a saving relationship with Jesus as a result of what the apostles say. The uh, not only the first and second generation of people who, who embrace his word and embrace his love for us, but I mean all the way down to us. That's what's included in the they also right here. Father, I desire that they also, whom you've given me, be with me where I am. Well, Jesus is going to the Father. He's going to heaven in that sense. He's going out of this world, which is the, really the point of this. And he says, I want them to be where I am. So that, <laughs> so we have another so that thing. Why does Jesus want us, the apostles and everyone who came after him, including us who've embraced his word and embraced who he is, why does he want us to be with him? And again, if, you, if you're kind of selfishly oriented, you'll say, because I want to be in the place where there's no more sorrow. Well, then yeah, that's true. I want to be in the place where there's no more sorrow. I want to be in a, a nice place rather than a bad place. But that's really not his point here. And if you're picking up the theme so far, you're probably thinking right now, so that, well, before it was so that we know that Jesus came from the Father. So it must have something to do with, with understanding who Jesus is and where he came from. And if that's what you're guessing, that's kind of what this is. So that they may see my glory, which you've given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. And so Jesus is getting to the, like the ultimate idea of unity, of fellowship with God himself. He says, I want them to be with me so that they can see everything about who I am. So that they can see my glory. That is, the, again, the full reveal of who he is that causes us to take five steps back in awe and go, wow. So that they may see my glory, who I am, which you have given me. For you love me before the foundation of the world. So again, this glory, this understanding of who Jesus is, the nature of who he is, which the apostles only had a, 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 an abbreviated ability to understand in those three years by, based on the, you know, the, the restriction of time as well as the restriction of this is Jesus in the flesh and you can only get to know him so much. You know, there's only so much time you can spend with each one of us, 12 every day and those limitations. He wants them to be with him so that they can see all of who he is, all of who he is, that they may see my glory, which interestingly enough, came from the Father. Now, how can Jesus' glory come from the Father? Well, if Jesus, again, is the radiance, he's the light, he's the outflowing, he's the expression of the Father, well, of course that comes from the Father because that's the nature of the Father as well. He, so yeah, that comes from the Father. He's not an independent entity in that sense. But here's the interesting thing, that last clause, he says, uh, for you have loved me before the foundation of the world. So what he's saying is that what I, when we talk about understanding my full glory, this right up here, what is that full glory? What is it about me that you might be missing so far that I want them to be with me so they'll see? I want them to see how much the Father loved the Son before the whole universe was even made. And, and now we come back to this interesting interesting thing that we don't understand from last week, which is, you know, if the Father and the Son are really one in the same um, in terms of being one God, how is it that that, that one, let's say, entity, <laughs> for want of a better word, can have love in its midst when, when they're one in the same? I mean, is this, is this self-love? And that's, that's kind of the that's the mystery that I don't think we'll ever fully unravel in all this. But what he's saying is that it's not easy for you in the, in the three years I've walked with you guys, it's not easy for you to understand the, the, the ultimate part of the reveal of who I am. And what that ultimate is, is the extraordinary love that is in God already, even before he makes people to love. That extraordinary love. 
that's what he wants them to see, is the magnitude of that love. Uh, again, you know, the idea is John's a big promoter, both here as well as in his letters later, saying that, you know, what if I had to come up with one word that expresses God, what would that be? He says, well, God is love. Well, if there's not an object for our love, how do you know that there's love? I mean, did, was God loved before he made mankind, before there was anyone like us that he could love? Was God love? And the answer is absolutely. Well, where was that love? It was actually in the Godhead, in the unity of who God is, there already is love. There already is love. And so what he's done is he's, he's opened up access to this love which has already existed in the midst of God himself and, and has included us as beneficiaries of that same love, the love that existed before the foundation of the world. So that's kind of the mystery, but that's what Jesus is saying straight up. I want them to be with me not so that their sorrow will end so much, but so they'll fully get what love is inside God. That's what he's saying right here. Whew, crazy. And then finally, he starts to bring this to a close. Oh, righteous Father, verse 25. Although the world has not known you, yet I know you. I have known you. And these have known that you sent me, and I have made your name known to them and will make it known. O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, that is, the natural state of this fallen world is to be ignorant about who God is, to be ignorant about the Creator. And Satan works very hard to cover up any evidence of that. <laughs> and yet he says, I've known you. And now even when he's saying this, he's claiming something that to an Old Testament Jewish ear sounds impossible for a human being because you can't be in God's presence and live um, because he is, he's so holy, he's so sinless, He's so exacting in his justice. So Jesus is saying, but I've known you. I mean, and that known, again, is that, is that word that's used classically in the Bible to talk about intimacy. It's applied to marital intimacy as well. But I've known you. I, he's saying, uh, I know who the Father is. I know, because he comes from there. And these have known that you sent me. So um, he's saying that the apostles, the apostles are convinced that Jesus has come from God and that in coming from the very presence of God, Jesus is a perfect reflection of who the heart of God himself is in, in the in, most intimate level. I've known you and these have known that you sent me. And I've made your name known. Again, your reputation, the, the, uh, the visible outward manifestation of who you are and the, and the dimensions of who you are in your name. I've made your name known to them and I will make it known. Now, what's he talking about there? There's, here's new information. How will he make the name of the Father even more known than he has before? Well, two ways probably. One, in the crucifixion and the resurrection. In the crucifixion, they're going to understand something about the dimension of God's love and Jesus' love for them as a result that they've never grasped ever before. I mean, they know his love. They know what he's done in their presence up to this point. But it's not until they see him die on their behalf, fully knowing that they'll abandon him and they'll leave him and they'll be separated from him. They'll run away like scared cats. And yet something about the magnitude of his love for them will become manifest very soon in their lives when they understand that. That's what will bring great joy as well. Not only that Jesus comes back from the dead, but that Jesus' love for them is much bigger than they ever expected. And we'll make it known maybe even further into the future as they spread out all over the world, um, as we spread out all over the place. He makes himself known to us more and more as we are, as we are placed in his word. Uh, for the apostles and for us at the moment we stand right here, we don't have a full understanding of who God is, but we have... Uh, we have an understanding to a certain degree. And that understanding, he's saying, will never quit. I will make it known and continue to build on that. And I, I think that's part of what the promise for eternity is, is the ability to continue to explore and understand who God is and to enjoy the love that was already there before he even made us and in, to be included in that love. And uh, so that's, that's what he's talking about. And we'll make it known. So that, okay, the last so that, <laughs> so that what? So that we'll know that Jesus came from the Father? Because that seems to be what it is so far. Well, here it is. So that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. This is a little different. This connected though. So that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. 
The purpose of all this, and this is his closing phrase in the entire prayer, um, this so that might actually uh, apply to everything we've read so far in this prayer in chapter 17, is that in knowing the Father, in having unity and an intimacy and unity with who God is himself and as a result with one another, but that intimacy with God, what it is we're really coming to understand and know is his love. Because after all, John's telling us that God is love. So that the love which Jesus has always enjoyed in the Godhead, you know, with which you loved me, may be in them. And here's that statement where basically Jesus is saying there has always been love in God. (laughs) You know, the Father for the Son, the Son for the Father. I mean, it's always been there. That love has always been there. And he says, I'm praying all these things so that these guys and everyone who comes after them, so that that love might be in them. So so not only is this love of God something we're placed into in unity with him, but it's something he places into us. Uh, I in God's love, God's love in me. It's the same kind of reciprocity he's been using in his relationship with the Father. And I in them. Jesus is saying, and I in them as well. So what he's saying is that when the love of the Father is in us, that same love that was in Jesus, it's the same as tantamount to saying that Jesus himself is in us. So if there's a confusion in your mind about, well, who's who, who's in who, uh, is Jesus in us, is the Father in us, is the Father and the Son abiding with us and in us, and, and I in you and you and me, and, well, what's going on? If all, of those, if all of those connections become troubling to you, that's because you're not stepping back far enough and understanding with awe what this unity of a relationship with God can be all about. There's, there's, there's actually a, uh, a blurring of, of distinctiveness in a way. I mean, we're still distinctive in terms of who we are as persons, but in terms of a oneness and a unity that's, that's beyond almost the scope of what we can understand, that, that's what he's talking about. If you, have a, if you have a rough idea about what marriage is all about... Um, you remember back in Genesis 2, uh, talking about the creation of man and woman, he says that they might become one flesh. Now we know that physically they're not one flesh, they're still two independent people, but there is a oneness that happens in those kind of very intimate relationships that while the two people keep their distinctiveness, and yet there is a profound oneness in the two of them that's based on that intimacy. Well, take that idea and multiply it by a billion and you start to understand, or you start to approach at least, the un-understandability un- of, of what this unity with God can be like. We're still distinct. We're still persons. We still are who we are. We're still someone who's unique that God loves. But we're also completely lost in intimacy with him. Um, so, uh, so there you go. <laughs> we need to wrap this up. Here's the summary. I'll just stand back and I'll tell you what we just talked about. Here's what Jesus prays. He starts with this prelude before he starts asking the Father on their behalf. And this prelude says, the Son and the Father have both been glorified. That is, what I, I'm, I'm here at the end of my physical, th- physical life here, and as a result of that, I've accomplished the fact that I have, I have done the large reveal, which has caused awe about not only who the Father is, but the Son is, and together as God. He says that he has defined what eternal life, what big abundant living is, and that eternal life is knowing God. Which, by the way, is something that you can start doing right now. doesn't have to wait until you're uh, in heaven. Um, He's noble now through the Holy Spirit, through the parakletos, the one who's called near. Um, So that's what eternal life is. Eternal life, according to the Bible, is a relationship. It's not a place. It's not a provision. It's not a lack of of uh, bad circumstances. I mean, eternal life is really a relationship with God himself. There is nothing more um, treasured and and eternal and abundant in life itself than the relationship with God. Now, you know, when you stop here and you think that sounds kind of simplistic, but in our experience as human beings, we, we sort of know part of this already. We know the value of relationships. We know as we look back in our life, if you were to assess what are those things that were just extraordinarily valuable to you as you've come through life, you'll probably put relationships with certain people on that list, whether it's with family or with friends, uh, with spouses, with children and parents, whatever it is, 
There is something that you and I both know, by the way the Creator's made us, that that relationship is, you know, this connection of intimacy with someone or something outside of us is what has been the source of real lasting value and real living in life. It's not materialism. It's not a whole host of other things. It's those relationships. Well, God's saying, to get a clue, the most fulfilling of all of life is knowing God in relationship, unity of intimacy with him. He says, the mission's accomplished. They know who I am. They know that I've come from you. They know I'm not just some man who happened to whiz through town one day with some fancy words. They know that actually I've come from you. And uh, so they've got that. They've got that figured out. And I've spoken these words so that um, my joy, the joy that Jesus has, might be full in them. And uh, pause right here to mention the fact that in Hebrews, in Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says that uh, when it talks about the cross and with Jesus, it says that for the joy set before him, that is Jesus, for the joy set before Jesus, he endured the cross. So uh, this is the joy that he intends for us to have um, made full in us. So now he's going to ask, and this is what he asked. He says, number one, guard and keep them while they're in the world because I'm not going to be here physically anymore. So you do that. You do that directly, Father. You can guard them. You can keep them. Um, reassure them as they're listening to my words that you are just as able of guarding and keeping them as I was physically when I was walking here. And specifically, guard them and keep them from the evil one, the one who stalks us, the one who looks to, to work against that abundant life, the one who steals and kills and destroys. Uh, not the good shepherd, the bad shepherd. Also set them apart. And how do I set them apart? That's the sanctifying, the pulling out of the fallen world. Set them apart through your word. Continue to, to uh, wash them in your word. And, and remember, as you think about the primary role of the Holy Spirit, the primary role of the Holy Spirit is truth, is the word. So that's, that's how we're continually pulled more and more out of this place and more and more into him in unity and intimacy is through his word. So unity, why? So that the world will believe in Jesus, believe who he is, that that unity would be manifest in and amongst us. Um, and unity so that the world knows that God loves them. Uh, that unity is an outward manifestation of the, of the intention of God uh, to draw men to himself uh, and to enjoy that same love that preexisted even the creation of the entire universe. So that love has always been there. And he prays that we would be with him, be with Jesus, to see his glory even more so that with us being with him, uh, the full reveal. Uh, Paul says we see like through a glass dimly. Um, we, we see some and what we see is true, but we don't see it all. And Jesus says, I want them to be with me so they'll see it all. The glory that I had even before the whole universe was made, they'll see it all. They'll understand in fullness and in intimacy the fullness of who God is and the fact that he is love embodied. And also that God's love might be in them. And as a result, Jesus in them. So he prays that, that through this experience, which for them is going to be hard as the many decades go, go on here, I want them to understand of God's love being in them and Jesus' presence in them as a result. So that's his prayer for the apostles. And that, by extension, is his prayer for us. Now, I want you to, to make a list in your mind as you think through this list what he did not pray for us. <laughs> there are so many things that in a selfish sense, if I was thinking, gee, if Jesus was going to pray for me, I can give him a short list that just be, would be wonderful. It's like, it's like a Santa Claus list. These are the things I want, Jesus. Can you do these for me? Um, and you know what? It, it wouldn't match this list at all because this list is not about me. It's about who he is. It's about who he is. And as we walk in our lives of loving him and following him, that becomes more and more what drives us that people will know who he is and not who we are. Not that people would be impressed with us or that people would necessarily love us, but that people would come to grasp who he is. And that, that becomes, by the end of life, just about all you're concerned with is, is him, who he is. And that's what Jesus prays, that the world might know who he is as demonstrated through our enjoyment of his love in us, of his Holy Spirit being in us, of our unity with him in intimacy the world would know who he really is. And that's, that's really the point. That's a, that's a goal that we love to have. Well, next week, uh, when we're back, uh, we start into the first Sunday of March, and we're going to start the sequence of events that's going to end here 
at Golgotha, at the crucifixion. And remember, the whole point of this, all of this, as Jesus mentions in his last phrases in, in this prayer for us, is so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them. It's so that the love of God might be actually in us. Not that we just experience it externally, but it actually would become part of the intimate center of who we are and I in them. So next week we start with the arrest of Jesus in the garden uh, with Judas coming and kissing him in order to identify who he is. And that whole sequence of events, which is very familiar to us about how Jesus actually yields to the powers that want to take him down, the ones that hate him so much because they know that he's not of this world, at least he's making those claims, and it just, it just ticks off the religious authorities. But there's much, more, there's much bigger evil at hand doing this, trying to take Jesus down, and that's going to start next week. Uh, and in the whole process, the evil one, thinking he's winning all along, will in the end lose because Jesus says, I have overcome the world. So that's what will be next week. Pray for us as we come back uh, that uh, God will finish what he sent us to Florida to do. And uh, in the meantime, uh, for next week, read the first half of John 18, because that's what we're going to look at next week in the first uh, Sunday in March, John 18. And, uh, and we'll just walk through these events as Jesus carries through and sets his face to Calvary. Okay, so let me pray for us really quick. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for... Um, the life-changingness of it. We thank you for the fact that after we dip our toe in it, we find we're up to our waist and over our heads and just um, loving the richness of your word to us. It draws us to you. It causes us to run to you and pray that you would increase our love for you and that we would increase our knowledge of who you are. The little that we know you right now causes us to want to do that. So we thank you for your word here, this part of John 17 and the rest of John as we go on. I pray that you would um, break our hearts, in a sense, with, uh, with the terrible cost it cost to bring us into the intimacy and unity of your love. Um, and Father, we just thank you that because of that, because of all these centuries since that time, as Jesus is praying for his apostles, and by extension, us, who would come to believe because of your word, uh, thank you for including us um, in the fellowship and the unity and the intimacy of your love. So thank you for all these things now, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.